It's the DeKalb County Fire Rescue Academy training video lecture series um, on pathophysiology chapter 8. I'd like to welcome everybody that is listening to the video. Preparing for the exam on Monday. Um, so we have quite a bit to talk about today. So probably, um, probably going to be the whole well not probably is going to be the whole chapter on pathophysiology in this video so i'm sure it will be longer than i like to uh, have videos um, but it's you know it's going to be used to study for the exam so um, you can fast forward the video uh, to the parts you need or rewind or however you'd like to do it to use it as a study um, guide or skill for you. Uh, hopefully you'll do well on your test. So let's just jump right in. Um, pathophysiology. So <clears throat> it's about perfusion. Um, and that's really what this uh, chapter is all about. It's about providing the cell with the oxygen, glucose, and other nutrients that it's going to need um, so that that cell can use those nutrients and let's not forget it's got to remove the waste as well in order for it to thrive and be healthy. The cell is important because cells make tissue, tissues make organs and organs make organ systems. So that's why um, when we talk about cellular death that it's so important. And so we open up the chapter and we talk about cellular metabolism. And we know from the classroom that there's two different types. There's aerobic and anaerobic. Um, the role here is to, um, at the end of the day, provide energy um, so that we can use that energy to provide all the vital functions that our body needs. Um, so again, there's aerobic and anaerobic, but there is consequences uh, when we're facing anaerobic, meaning uh, cellular hypoxia. And which of these two types of metabolism, aerobic or anaerobic, which of these two types occur depends on the presence of oxygen. Uh, so here's a slide that represents the cell, the glucose and the oxygen and the energy that we'll get from that. Uh, we define a few things at the beginning, uh, glucose being the primary fuel uh, that uh, the cell needs. And then we call oxygen a catalyst. And then a catalyst uh, increases the rate of a chemical reaction. So the oxygen itself is going to combine with the glucose and it's going to be like gasoline on a fire. It's going to make, it's going to make it uh, react quicker, better, and provide that much needed energy that our body needs to survive. Um, we're going in now to the aerobic and um, when we talk about aerobic metabolism we talk about with oxygen in the presence of oxygen and we take a look at it here um, we start off with glycolysis now glycolysis is just this process that could be it could have um, it could have O2, oxygen can be there, or oxygen may not, but glycolysis will occur. And we have glycolysis so that we can show you the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. Glycolysis is the basic part. So what we have here is a cell, and this cell happens to have O2 in it. We have glucose that goes in the cell, we have O2 there, 
and we have pyruvic acid and just O2 glucose is going to make pyruvic acid and we could have no O2 we just have glucose in that cell reacting and we're going to get pyruvic acid so glycolysis does not require oxygen and don't get too hung up on that I just want you to to know the difference between aerobic and anaerobic so don't get hung up on glycolysis let's talk about aerobic so here we go we have oxygen and glucose that meet in the cell we get a production of pyruvic acid and we get a production of ATP so what does that mean well what that means is that we get a lot of energy we get heat we get carbon dioxide and we get water and so those are essential we need the heat to maintain a body core temperature all right we need the water to be used in various places and the co2 we talked about is waste and we get that but co2 also can be used as bicarbonate and we can use that to fight acid buildup once it mixes in the blood with plasma um, so a bunch of different purposes here with these we call them byproducts they're very very much needed but then we get to anaerobic and so anaerobic I've said is the evil stepsister of aerobic or stepbrother however you however you'd like it right uh, without okay so without oxygen so this is where the problem exists so you can imagine anaerobic without and so when i think without oxygen think about folks who are having asthma attacks who are you know in a situation where they can't have a gas exchange it's missing oxygen so you know it cannot be good we need oxygen vitally to to uh, live and so let's look at it so we have glucose we have o2 missing we still get the pyruvic acid we get a little bit of energy okay not much and it's not enough we're stingy with our energy we need it and <clears throat> two moles is not enough energy and we get a byproduct up here called lactic acid and that's that's bad um, that's a very bad acid and it's going to cause destruction and eventually death if we don't get that under control um, now we introduce the sodium potassium pump and what I'd like you to know about the sodium potassium pump is that what I talked about in class it requires energy the sodium potassium pump requires energy to work um, and we had talked about the potassium being inside the cell and the sodium living outside the cell um, they're both positively charged ions they enjoy where they're at and the only way that they can pretty much get in and out of the cell is if they're pumped against their will in and out that pumping against you know against their will requires energy and so the body responds and provides on normal base <clears throat> excuse me on normal basis provides the energy needed but the function of this sodium potassium pump and we're not going to get real deep in this i'm just going to throw a, an essential function is muscle contraction and when we think about muscle contraction we think about skeletal muscle but we also got to remember that the heart needs us too to contract so obviously if, if we're having problems contracting the heart then we're going to have issues right and that's just one of many functions that the sodium potassium pump has in an anaerobic metabolism 
it begins to affect that and it can eventually destroy it. That's why anaerobic is just so bad. We can also, in anaerobic, have a problem with sodium that, that gets trapped inside the cell. And one of the properties of sodium is it attracts water. So now we have sodium that's attracting water. And the reason why I can't get out of the cell, obviously the sodium potassium pump has failed. And it starts attracting water. Water starts rushing into the cell. The cell begins to swell and eventually it dies. This important uh, slide right here, it's a, it shows you aerobic and anaerobic. It shows you what you get. Um, <clears throat> so we can look at aerobic and we see that we get aerobic with meaning with oxygen. We get heat to maintain body core temperature. CO2 to be transported by the blood to the lungs and exhaled, but, and exhaled, but Remember also we get that bicarb that fights acid from that CO2 and then we get the water that's reabsorbed by the body or, or excreted. And then if we look at anaerobic, we see that we get lactic acid, which will affect the function and the stability and eventually lead to the death of the cell. And we don't get a whole lot of the ATP that requires that, that requires, I'm sorry, that, that brings us the energy. We get very little ATP and that's a problem when these cells have functions, they have jobs. If they don't have the energy, they can't do their job. And then, which leads us to perfusion. It's the fundamental purpose of emergency care is to continue is to maintain perfusion. And so what we have is oxygen, glucose, and other nutrients here that need to get to the cell. <clears throat> Here's your oxygen. This is just the uh, chemical equation for glucose and other nutrients need to come into the cell to be, to be used in aerobic metabolism. We also need to get rid of the waste. And that's just the fundamental parts of emergency care is to identify what's affecting the perfusion and try to correct it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this slide shows us the components necessary for adequate perfusion. <clears throat> but there's three basic things that we need and we talked about it also in class. We, we mentioned that we need a patent airway Okay, we need plenty of red blood cells because red blood cells transport oxygen and we need a strong heart or a strong pump to one, maintain that, help us maintain that blood pressure, but to also circulate the blood. Any condition that interferes with maintaining perfusion uh, results in anaerobic metabolism, hypoxia, cellular death, organ death, and ultimately death of the patient. Okay, so that which leads us into now, so now we're going to start talking about um, maintaining perfusion and we can't maintain perfusion if the simplest things aren't there and some of the simplest things is the ambient air and I pay special attention to this oxygen here because 21 percent oxygen is what we breathe in from the atmosphere that can be represented in an FiO2 of 0.21 and the I we're going to talk about meaning inspired. <clears throat> 
So we're talking about FiO2 again, the fraction of inspired oxygen. And the key word here is inspired. Inspired meaning that we can still inspire. We can still breathe in. And the key to breathing in for inspired, <clears throat> excuse me, is that oxygen reaches the alveoli. So when we breathe in, oxygen has to come in through the mouth, okay, come in through the, or the nose, comes into the back of the nasal pharynx, or just, you know, the back part of your throat, all right, where, where your nose and the back of your throat come together, <clears throat> comes down from there to the oral pharynx, which is what you probably think of as your common throat. From there down the trachea, and from the trachea, you have the carina there that separates the bronchi from the left and right. So you have your left main stem bronchus and your right main stem bronchus that leads to your lungs. Those get smaller and they're known as bronchioles and down to the alveoli. But back to the eye, we have to be able to, to get that inspired air to the alveoli. And then we have FD, FDO2. And that's the fraction of delivered oxygen. So when we inspire, we're doing that on our own. But if we lose the ability to inspire, then oxygen will have to be delivered. Okay, so oxygen is going to have to be delivered, and it can be delivered in a variety of ways. Here we show if it's delivered, here's a BiPAP. Um, or ventilation device okay that's mechanically being delivered we, we I showed the example in class today of the positive pressure ventilation from a bag valve mask that was us actually delivering oxygen now here's a oxygen mask that you would place on the face you, there is no mechanical piece to this the patient would just inspire oxygen in through the non-rebreather. And toxic gases, look, you know, toxic gases, um, and what I think of is in the fire department, um, all the guys at 24 um, who do specialty rescues, patient maybe trapped in a manhole um, deep underground, uh, we get less oxygen from atmosphere when we go underground and so we have to make sure that air is tested before we go traveling in um, because without 21 percent oxygen we'll start running into problems all right so we've talked about the the atmosphere let's talk about the airway Again, we're talking about perfusion and maintaining perfusion, and we can't maintain perfusion unless we have a patent airway. And when we talk about the airway, uh, we'll get we'll talk about the structures in a second, but we covered that in chapter seven. But we'll review it again. We have anytime we, we face problems from blood secretions, vomitus, tissue, bone, teeth, any other substance that that's going to restrict airflow down to, to, to the alveoli for gas exchange, then we're hampering perfusion. So we have to make sure that we identify that rapidly and remove it. All right, so we lead off here with the nasopharynx, and we can look here and see that the nasopharynx comes in through the nose, and you'll see right here. and it's probably the least complicated part of the airway. Um, we have to still use um, special regard and pay attention to it because everything from the nasopharynx is going to end up going down to the oropharynx and that is going to be our danger zone. But nasopharynx, usually we can control that pretty well. Uh, we just have to pay those special attention to it.
But then we get into the oil pharynx and the pharynx. And now this is the part that's super dangerous. We have to not be fooled and uh, let our guard down and, and miss, a, miss an airway obstruction here. And why it's so easy because to miss something here because the tongue can be a culprit here. The tongue can relax and it can actually cause problems by um, allowing the epiglottis to slide down and block the glottic opening. We have to be you special um, we have to be very alert to foreign bodies. Any type of tissue swelling that we might see that in an anaphylactic reaction. We'll talk about that in allergic reactions. Hematomas, so swelling from trauma in the airway, blood or vomit. <clears throat> the slide represents an obstructive airway. And you can see that the airway has been closed off here. Um, and see the positioning of the head on the pillow has got the head bent down. And we would need to fix that uh, in the medical patient with a head tilt chin lift, in the trauma patient, we would use a modified jaw thrust. Aspiration of liquids. So we have to be careful that liquids go down the esophagus and to the stomach instead of, instead of the trachea leading to the lungs. Because that can lead to um, the alveolar, the alveolar, alveolar, the alveoli being blocked by fluid and a gas exchange would not occur. <coughs> Excuse me, man. I got a little cough right now. All right. So um, let's take a look here. Uh, the epiglottis. Um, when we talk about the epiglottis, um, it is. Um, Normally, uh, it's a gatekeeper in, in many ways. It helps to uh, keep food and liquids out of the trachea, but if it gets infected and becomes inflamed, um, gets inflammation, it would change names. It then become epiglottitis. And it can swell enough to where it could block the actual glottic opening. Um, and like I said earlier, the epiglottis is very capable of blocking the glottic opening when the muscles of the tongue relax. We'll tell you, show you a way to deal with that right here. Uh, you'll see that the, there's the head tilt chin lift. Uh, this is designed for a medical patient, of course, without neck or spinal injuries. Two fingers on the chin, one on the forehead. Lifting it back actually removes that epiglottis away from the glottic opening and it allows the airway to be restored. Now, patient's unconscious, we need to make sure that we keep this because uh, this, can, this head can actually slide back down rather easily. But there's airway adjuncts that we'll talk about in respiratory that we can use too to help us with that. Here we have the larynx. And now the larynx is going to divide the upper and lower airways. Another view of the epiglottitis right here. Epiglottis, sorry, the epiglottis. The larynx contains the vocal cords that you see here. Um, we are subject to the vocal cords having spasms and those are called laryngeal spasms that can hamper gas exchange. We compare the child with the adult here and we can see that cone shaped airway problem that we talked about. Tracheal is the trachea is distal to the larynx and that's part of the lower airway. And then we have the trachea that comes down, meets up with the carina right here in the middle, splits off between left and right. We have your bronchioles, your bronchioles that lead down to the alveoli. Here we show the picture of a bronchial that is, sorry about that, 
a bronchial here that is constricted from an asthma patient. And then here's a normal size bronchial that can hamper gas exchange and cause an increase in CO2. An increase in CO2 is called hyper, meaning high, carbia, meaning CO2. We talked about emphysema. <clears throat> and here we start talking about airway resistance. The resistance of air and the airways. So if your airways begin to shrink, then we will increase resistance. If the airways are nice and normal size, we decrease resistance. Uh, we talk about surfactant and surfactant is uh, there to increase surface area of the alveoli and allowing that O2 to be stored there and allowing the elimination of CO2. And the slide here shows an emphysema patient's alveoli compared. We can tell that we have a lot of alveoli in that slide missing. And that's the problem with emphysema. The alveoli is destroyed. So the alveoli is a major part of gas exchange. Normally millions in numbers has a rich, rich blood supply, maintains a high concentration of O2 and CO2 on CO2's way to be eliminated through exhalation. All right, and then here's your uh, capillaries up here. And the alveoli capillary bed's very thin and it's thin so that diffusion can have a short pathway. So compliance, and so it's important to understand the definition of compliance. And when we talk about compliance, what we're talking about is the ability of the chest wall and the lungs to be able to stretch. They must be able to stretch in order to allow for gas exchange. So the more narrow here and the less stretch we have in these balloons represents a high compliance. And then the, the large stretch in the big balloons represent the lower compliance. Remember, the chapter is about perfusion and maintaining perfusion. I like to repeat that every now and then so that we don't lose focus while we're looking at the anatomy and talking about the physiology. So here we have the thoracic cavity. Um, you'll see here it plays an integral role, of course, in maintaining ventilation. I think we have a better slide coming up. And then we talk about the structural parts, the structural parts of that thoracic cavity is necessary for normal ventilation. Neck muscles, and because that's gonna, gonna be there to help expand and lift. And then we talk about the ribs <clears throat> and of course the diaphragm muscle that's going to contract down to allow for inspiration and relax to allow for expiration. We're going to talk later here about the lungs and the pleural linings, specifically in the pleural lining, the visceral pleural that actually contacts the lungs and the parietal pleural that will essentially connect to the chest wall. But before we get there, we got to talk about Boyle's Law and what it, and how it applies to us as in, in uh, respiration and in, I'm sorry, in inspiration and exhalation, really. So let's look at it real quick. Uh, we introduce the Boyle's Law as 
all about pressure and gas. So, and when you think about gas, think about the essential gas of O2, really, because that's what the alveoli needs to get down to the alve get down to them to make a gas exchange. So, the pressure actually comes from the increasing the size of the chest. So increasing the size of a closed container will decrease internal pressure and that's what creates that negative pressure and we're going to talk more about that here in a second. So 760 is the key number. That 760 is normal atmospheric pressure. In order for the chest to expand we're going to end up having the diaphragm contract downward and when this happens we are going to have a drop in pressure okay so we're going to drop down somewhere around 756 just a few points it's just enough to show that the pressure becomes more negative but if we look back up at the slide here if the pressure becomes more negative we can compare that to what Boyle's laws means because we see an increase in gas so with this increase in gas the major gas being oxygen is allowed to come in and go down from the outside down the trachea to the bronchioles and finally making it to the alveoli because when pressure becomes more negative gas increases <clears throat> so let's take a look at when we when the diaphragm relaxes what happens well we can look here and we see that our atmospheric pressure goes up to somewhere around 762 so it's becoming less negative. So let's look up back at Bull's Law. And we can see that it's inverse, meaning when pressure is increasing, the volume of gas is decreasing, which again makes sense because we're getting rid of CO2. We're not collecting any more gas so the theory works out for us so let's talk about now that we kind of get where we have a pressure becoming more negative allowing gas to become more abundant or more positive let's look at some of the other things that is going on here when the diaphragm contracts downward our rib cage is expanding and it's lifting up we have the parietal pleural that attaches to the chest wall with the visceral pleural that attaches to the lungs when the chest wall expands the parietal pleural helps to pull the lungs out helps to pull the lungs out so that they will expand and when they expand it opens up more room where the alveoli are so that oxygen can be collected and then when the chest relaxes sorry when the diaphragm relaxes it allows that co2 now to escape and move away here we have a slide that shows the external intercostal muscles and what we need to know about those <clears throat> is that if the intercostal muscles have been activated then we're going to be working harder obviously to breathe 
and we're using more energy. So there is an energy requirement already for the contraction of the diaphragm. But normally, when, we, when the diaphragm relaxes and goes back to its normal size, there's not an energy requirement because the diaphragm is simply relaxing. However, we can change that up a little bit because if there's lots of disease processes out there, asthma, emphysema, that once they're present, we, we have problems. And some of those problems mean it's hard for those patients to get air out of the lungs. Air becomes trapped in these, in these circumstances. And so then we have an activation of the internal intercostal muscles and several others here in the slide you could see there. But when these guys are activated, now it becomes an energy requirement. Now something that's normally passive, meaning, meaning no energy requirement, has become now an energy requirement. So, so why? I mean, why is this important, right? So this becomes extremely important because if I could take you back to anaerobic metabolism, we have very little energy already being produced and so many jobs that the cell needs to do. And we even talked about the sodium potassium pump and its job in muscle contraction. And here we are now using muscles that we normally don't need, don't use, producing energy requirements that, that aren't normal. So you can imagine if you just look at the energy cost that we are in the deficit. And when we become in the deficit of an energy problem or crisis, then it can lead to respiratory failure. Respiratory failure means that oxygen is not being sent to the alveoli and so there's, there's very little gas exchange occurring and that's how respiratory failure can end up becoming a big issue. So what we say is that if you arrive and someone's working that hard to breathe, they're using muscles to inhale and muscles to exhale, that we should anticipate respiratory failure. Again, this chapter is about perfusion and maintaining perfusion. We identify that rapidly. If we have a patient who can, in, who can inspire then we need to be thinking about respiratory failure and having the equipment ready to provide the delivery of oxygen. Now, if the patient's already in failure, then we need to immediately go to work and resolving that perfusion problem. So we talk about increase in airway resistance. So what's that mean? It means it's more difficult to move air through the airways because they're constricted or because air is being trapped. We can't, the, it, the airways are no longer working for us. They're becoming restricted. It's hard to move air through a restricted airway. And most common causes of airway restriction we can look at edema, which means swelling within the airways, mucus, constricted bronchioles. And airway was resistance, we're gonna have an increase in that when the radius of the airways becomes smaller. It makes sense, right? So you have a straw, you're trying to drink something out of a straw, 
And then I go, hang on a second, and I give you a coffee stir. And I say, go ahead and take a drink out with this. Well, you notice right away that you can't get the same volume of liquid out of that coffee stir that you just did out of the straw. And that's the point. The resistance has increased because the straw is smaller. So we're back looking now at the parietal pleural and the visceral pleural. So the visceral pleural here connecting to the lung tissue itself. The parietal pleural in, in contact with the chest wall here. And something comes up now that we need to kind of pay attention to is that we can see there's a space in between right here. Okay, and we like to call that the potential space. Uh, you know, I think of it as a potential space for problems. Um, and it is. As long as the potential space is in its normal, normal position, no problems, right? But if we lose contact, if we lose contact here with the visceral pleural or the parietal pleural to the chest wall, <clears throat> and then we have problems. We already said that it's these connections here that when the chest expands, it lifts that lung up so that it can expand for gas exchange. So that's a major deal. But this space in the middle, it's it's unique because this the the space here is always negative in pressure. Okay, and you're probably thinking, oh, here we go again. Oh, this pressure and gas. No, not really. I want you to just think of it as a negative pressure. Um, but I kind of like to think of it as a vacuum cleaner. A negative pressure is going to suck, right? And, and that's what it does. And if we lose contact here and the atmosphere is open... then we're going to allow air to be sucked in to the chest cavity. And as you can imagine, air coming into the chest cavity, we're going to be able to, to, we're going to bring it in with no problem. But once it gets in here, it can't escape because it's a vacuum. It vacuums air in. It's going to have a hard time escaping. So if I put enough air in this lung here, is going to eventually collapse. And you can imagine with the alveoli down here, if this lung collapses, we lose gas exchange. And remember, we're talking about perfusion, perfusion and maintaining perfusion. If for some reason we lose the ability for that gas exchange, then we're hampering perfusion. So we will need to deal with that immediately. Whether it be delivery of O2 or whether it be calling for an ALS unit and having a paramedic come out and providing the necessary treatment to reduce this pressure inside the chest cavity. Okay, more definitions, more definitions. But you know, it's not, it's not like they're really hard um, because it kind of gives it away here, minute volume. And we can look here, it's the amount of air moved in and out of the lungs in one minute. It says one minute, kind of gives it away. Then we have tidal volume. And this is the volume of air breathed in with each individual breath. This has nothing to do with time. This is just has to do with the volume of air that you can bring in with an individual breath. Oops, sorry about that. And then we have frequency of ventilations. And this is simply frequency, meaning number of times, the number of ventilations in one minute. So now what the book does 
the author, also the author of the book, he really wants you to understand the process of bringing air in and out. And when this process is hampered, what the consequences are. And so that's why there is, you know, that's why we're getting into this. And I don't expect anybody to start figuring out extremely complicated math equations in the field in order to understand hypoxia. But we should take this time while we're in school to, to really get a clear picture of what it's like when you don't bring enough air in and how that, that can lead to hypoxia and certainly cell death eventually leading to organ death and human death, the organism. So um, we have minute ventilation here and what we're looking at is tidal volume and we'll multiply the tidal volume by the frequency of ventilations, which is just your respiratory rate, the number of times per minute that you take a breath. Now, we're going to give you, on average, a constant number on average. And we're going to call that 500 milliliters of tidal volume. And you simply multiply that times 12 breaths per minute, and you'll come up with roughly 6 liters of a minute of of minute ventilation and we're calling that respiratory rate a minute 12 so that's that's all there is to that but <clears throat> we have another one and so this is called alveolar ventilation so we're talking we just talked about tidal volume, minute ventilation, that's the, that's the amount of air that we're going to bring in. But now what we want to talk about is we want to talk about how that air reflects in the alveoli because it's that's where we're wanting to get this air and oxygen is to the alveoli. So we look at alveolar ventilation. We talk about the amount of air moved in and out of the alveoli in one minute. And we introduce dead air space. Because not all the air that we're going to breathe in is going to actually make it to the alveoli. So we're talking, we're talking 150 milliliters of it's going to be lost just to not making it down to the alveoli you know drifting over here drifting over there and so when you look at it now we're we're only getting a roughly 350 milliliters of that tidal volume to be used for gas exchange so we're going to continue to show you why that's such a big deal So when we look at alveolar ventilation, we're going to take that dead air space, which is a constant around 150, and we're going to take that and multiply it by the respiratory rate per minute. So we're looking at, we're going to give you 12 breaths per minute, call it, call it normal. And we're going to take that dead air space. So we're going to take 500 minus 150. And so now from that six liters, we're looking at right at four liters per minute. So we went from six liters to four liters, reaching the alveolar for gas exchange. <clears throat> so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a patient who's in respiratory distress. And we're gonna show you that they have, they're bringing in roughly a tidal volume of 200 milliliters and they're breathing 28 times per minute. We're going to take 200 milliliters and we're going to take 150 of that for dead air space. And we're going to multiply that by 28 breaths per minute. And look here, we have 1.4 liters. So we went from a normal, after you subtract dead air space, we're looking at four liters. That's a big deal. Now we're looking at one, 
one liter. And we had to subtract dead air space first. Dead air space doesn't, doesn't reach the alveoli. So this is the reason why when we talk about perfusion and maintaining perfusion, that we have to recognize respiratory failure when it, we need to recognize when it's occurring and we also need to recognize the treatment for that. So when we talk about assessing the respiratory rate, we'd like you to also understand it's not just the number of breaths per minute, but the tidal volume that the person's bringing in is just as important, if not more important, than the number of times per minute a patient's breathing. Inadequate ventilation can certainly come from low tidal volume. And we need to also recognize that yes, a respiratory rate that's too slow or too fast can be of concern as well. Now we've talked about in class, if I said 12 to 20 breaths per minute is normal and somebody's breathing at 28 breaths per minute, but they have the appropriate amount of tidal volume. Well, we said this patient is not in failure. Now they certainly may be in respiratory distress, but they're not in failure. But if I show you a respiratory rate that's 40 breaths per minute, more than likely there's no way to avoid failure with a respiratory, respiratory rate of 40 and 60 in pediatric patients. All right, so now we're moving on to the regulation of ventilation. We talk about receptors here. And we now we go into the chemo receptors and what they do. So we introduce the cent central chemo receptors as those in the medulla that report on hydrogen and CO2 in the spinal fluid. Now, hydrogen represents acid. And so the body, the, these uh, central chemoreceptors are very concerned with acid and CO2, which leads to acid. So very worried about the acidity of, of the fluid in the body. And then we have the, what we call the peripheral chemoreceptors. Now these are located in the carotid arteries and the aortic arch. And what they monitor is CO2 hydrogen so the same so far as a central but we're going to additionally monitor O2 and so that's the difference between the peripheral and the central is that we have the ability here to read O2 that's going to be important here in a second normal pay, normal breathing individuals we take breaths based on our current CO2, our current carbon dioxide levels, not O2 levels. And there's reasons behind that. We'll get into it in a second. But so that's how we breathe. If we're retaining CO2, then the body says, you know what? You need to breathe faster. So our respiratory rate will kick up. If we're blowing too much CO2 off, then our respiratory rate will slow down to retain it. But there's certain disease processes where this doesn't work for everybody. 
And those certain disease processes, such as COPD and emphysema, these patients, remember I said the emphysema patients have problems with their alveoli being destroyed. They have extremely challenged when it comes to gas exchange. They retain CO2 uh, quite, you know, a lot to be, you know, because they can't get rid of it. And so the body says, you know, um, I'm going to switch off. I'm going to start reading O2 because it's easier for me to distinguish the O2 in reference to the CO2. In normal people, the reason why our body runs off CO2 as the respiratory blood gas for inspiration is because we have so many alveoli and we have so much O2 that's stored in them that if our body read just O2 then you could stop breathing for a minute or two before before the receptor would would even pick up on a problem but that's not the case for CO2 because it's it's being dropped off at the alveoli and breathed out and so therefore once it's out it's out and the process continues so that's why it's a better gas for breathing so we have a few more to talk about baroreceptors baroreceptors are those stretch receptors found in smooth muscles uh, it's not a don't uh, let me skip this slide <laughs> before i get people confused we have irritant receptors and j receptors uh, baroreceptors are going to be in smooth muscle only we'll get to those in a minute but j receptors are in the alveoli and they monitor the pressure inside the alveoli i think the book mentions those short breaths uh, that occur when the J receptors have been activated it's reading pressure and it doesn't want a whole lot more pressure in that alveoli if that's the case so it starts regulating the amount of air coming in and that would reflect short small breaths but J receptors are still kind of argumentative in many communities of the science world the irritant receptors well, they're just that. If you breathe in something that irritates the bronchioles, it's going to cause you to call for sneeze and that sort of thing. I'm not going to cover that either in this video. I'm not covering acid base in this video. I'm not covering DRG, VRG in this video. I will, we'll talk about ventilation perfusion, the VQ ratio. A very important ratio that we need to talk about. Um, and I'm going to make it quite simple for you to understand. V for ventilation. Okay, so V for ventilation. There's two ways that, there's two different, the respiratory and the circulatory or cardiac systems work side by side in order to make a gas exchange but their jobs are very different very different so let's go with the ventilation or the respiratory system first and we've talked about it it's just that's just the process of bringing that ambient 21 percent fio2 as long as you're inspiring from the outside in to the alveoli it's basic breathing getting oxygen to the alveoli and we did we just showed several conditions that would hamper perfusion we talked about asthma we talked about bronchial constriction we talked about emphysema we can mention bronchitis um, anything that affects those bronchioles getting air to the alveoli is going to be a ventilation problem 
all day long. Remember, they're taking oxygen to the alveoli. Now, let's talk about the Q or the perfusion part of this. And that's getting blood to the capillaries just above the alveoli here. So here's your alveoli and here's your capillaries. It's getting blood down to the capillaries, okay? So that blood can drop off CO2 and pick up O2. Anything that affects the circulation of the blood, bringing CO2, dropping it off and picking up O2 is going to be a perfusion or Q problem. If I'm involved in a car accident and I have a hemorrhage, a bleeding out, you know, from an, you know, an amputated arm, and I'm bleeding from there, we must stop that bleeding in order to maintain perfusion. If I'm bleeding internally, we must rapidly transport this patient to a trauma center, not any local area hospital, but a trauma center, so that perfusion can be maintained, corrected, and maintained. That is a Q issue. Um, I said earlier that there's three things that we need to do to maintain perfusion. One, we need a patent airway. Two, we need plenty of red blood cells all right, to deliver oxygen to the cell. And three, we need a pump, a good pump, meaning the heart needs to be working properly. We need all of those to be working in order to maintain perfusion. Here we have the pump. If it starts not working correctly, we won't be able to send blood to the, to the capillaries here to maintain perfusion. If we're losing blood, then we're losing red blood cells. Red blood cells that have hemoglobin and all that. Um, and iron, we'll get to that in a minute, to maintain perfusion. So stop the bleeding. That's, I mean, that's where we're at. Stop the bleeding. Okay, and so here we are talking about oxygen transport. Oxygen is transported via the red blood cell. The red blood cell is special because it has hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is used to transport oxygen. But even hemoglobin needs one more thing, and that's going to be iron. So think of it as Think of it as hemoglobin being the car and iron being the seats in the car. Whoops. And so here we have a hemoglobin molecule here. And so, yeah, we need the iron to provide those seats for the oxygen. Okay, so hemoglobin and iron, they're gonna drop off oxygen to the cell and then they're going to pick up CO2 on the back side of that hemoglobin. We'll get to that in a second. All right, here we are. Let's talk about it. So oxygen, oxygen can be transported in two ways. It can be in the dissolve, dissolved in the plasma or on the hemoglobin. What is plasma? It's mostly water. <clears throat> So it does not like holding oxygen, uh, you know, H2O. It doesn't like to start picking up more oxygen. So that's why you're only going to get like 2% maybe that's going to be dissolved in the plasma, 1.5%. The rest of that oxygen, ah, uh, sorry guys. The rest of that oxygen is transported in the hemoglobin. So let's take a look. Let's go through this here. Blood comes in through the inferior superior vena cava into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonic valve, and out through the pulmonary arteries. We're down here in the pulmonary arteries. We're picking up O2 and we're getting rid of CO2. 
we're going to come back up here all right through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium through the mitral valve or bicuspid valve into that left ventricle that left ventricle is going to pump us out through the aortic valve and then out the aorta we're coming down and here we have a red blood cell the red blood cell here has hemoglobin and the iron is holding the o2 in place the o the o2 is going to come out why because down here in this systemic tissue there's very little oxygen we're going to go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration here drop off this o2 see we have hemoglobin nothing on it now here we come co2 it's going to come up here and attach itself to this back side of this hemoglobin molecule and it's only going to be about 23 percent of the co2 is going to do that it's going to attach to the back side of this hemoglobin molecule again because there is no hemoglobin i'm sorry there is no co2 up here very little this co2 higher concentration lower concentration it's coming there so 70 percent of the co2 is going to be dropped off here into the plasma okay and it's going to be transported as not co2 it's going to, be, it's going to make bicarbonate bicarbonate is found in all your antacids pepsid ac um um, I'm called Pepto Bismol, I think. Uh, anything that you take for as an antacid. And that's the reason why that is, is because sometimes the blood becomes acidic. Whoops. And it needs that, it needs that bicarb. And so, yeah, so here we are. And it's, it's pretty cool because it, if it's too, what we call alkalotic I means too basey well we could just pick up another hydrogen here and make a weak acid out of it so it works out great for that but we need to understand that diffusion process here and how co2 comes up onto the back side of this and how it comes into the plasma it will separate back out when it gets back over to the lungs co2 will separate out of this back into the lungs and we'll breathe it out so here we have co2 being transported same concept as i just explained so let's talk about the blood real quick um we have some parts here that we need to be familiar with we have the red blood cell that we just talked about white blood cell the white blood cells job and function is to fight infection and then we have platelets the platelet job is to clot blood okay clotting again we're talking about perfusion and maintaining perfusion and if we need to maintain perfusion so that we don't lose any of these guys all right let's talk about the venous system we're talking about supplying the right side of the heart with blood why because the right side is going to going to account for volume okay that's the right side of the heart's job the left side of the heart's job is to pump that blood out into the systemic circulatory system so that that O2 can be dropped off. We're going to talk about hydrostatic pressure now. Um, <clears throat> hydrostatic pressure is the force inside that vessel. All right. Um, it's a push. And what ends up happening is if the blood pressure gets too high 
the heart pumps against the blood pressure and a pressure called hydrostatic pressure actually pushes fluid in to the interstitial spaces just outside the capillaries. That fluid is known as edema is going to leak out into those spaces and eventually cause swelling. When it leaks out, it could leak out and block the alveoli, causing a gas exchange problem. If the alveoli is covered with fluid or pneumonia, anything blocks these alveoli, then we have a gas exchange problem. So we have the left ventricle here. What happens? So again, your left ventricle here is a normal size. It's pumping normally. But if we increase blood pressure, the left ventricle must pump against that pressure. If it does, it's having to work harder to get blood up and over the aortic arch. And that left ventricle will begin. It's a muscle. So if it works harder, it, it grows. And it can grow so large that it becomes stiff and non-compliant and it can't get that squeeze that it needs to pump against the pressure anymore. Blood then will begin to back up through the pulmonary veins from the pulmonary veins back into the lung and the lung tissue. Hydrostatic pressure will still be coming out and about, coming down, and causing more and more edema to the point to where the alveoli will be so saturated that little gas, gas exchange will occur. The, if this continues, like I said, the alveoli will collapse and that will lead ultimately to cellular hypoxia because if the alveoli collapse, gas exchange will not happen. The opposite of hydrostatic pressure is oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure with albumin pulls water in, back into the circular back into the vessels where it belongs it's it's there anyway to try to keep this from happening but hydrostatic pressure if it's enough can override oncotic pressure causing this to happen causing that that edema to occur We're going to talk about pump function now, the heart functions. Need to be familiar with these. Cardiac output, amount of blood ejected from the left ventricle in one minute. So cardiac output is dependent upon two things, heart rate and stroke volume. Cardiac output is a major influence on blood pressure. Normal cardiac output about five liters and it's the left ventricle that I just showed whose, whose job is to pump that volume through the vascular system I just said that I just said that cardiac output is dependent upon heart rate and stroke volume so let's look at heart rate because if we're needing to adjust cardiac output, those are the two things that we're going to have to work with. Now, heart rate, meaning the number of contractions of the heart in one minute. And when we talk about the factors that control heart rate that we can work with, we're talking about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. We're talking about epi and norepi. We're talking about beta 1. 
beta 1, one heart, beta 2, two lungs. That's how we remember it. Beta 1, meaning one heart, we talked about it in chapter 7, can increase the heart rate, and it can also increase the contraction of that left ventricle. Parasympathetic is usually there to reduce heart rate. Our second thing that we can work with is stroke volume. Stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected from the left ventricle with each contraction. So if we're going to mess around with stroke volume, we have to understand that stroke volume is dependent upon preload, myocardial contractility, and afterload. So let's look at those in a second. <clears throat> yeah, preload. So to understand preload, we have to understand a couple of different things. So stay with me on this. When we're talking about preload, we need to, to understand what diastole is. Now diastole is the phase of the heartbeat when the heart muscle is relaxed. Okay, that's what allows that left ventricle to fill with blood. You can't feel it if it's contracting. It has to relax long enough to fill it with blood. And then we look at systole. And now that's the part where the heart muscle is going to actually contract. And it's going to send that blood from the left ventricle through the aortic valve and out to the body. When we talk about preload, what we're talking about is stretching that left ventricle out like a rubber band. We're going to fill that left ventricle with more volume of blood than it's used to having. When we do that, it stretches the left ventricle out more than it's used to. And when we stretch something out just like a rubber band, it provides enough force to when we let the rubber band go it shoots blood up and out with force and velocity out that aortic valve and into the aorta with like I said with force and velocity preload is dependent upon that diastole period, that period of rest prior to the contraction. If that left ventricle is contracting too fast, we will not be able to increase preload. Matter of fact, we'll lose preload. What we're looking at is that duration of relaxation time and we're also dependent upon that volume of blood coming from the right side of the heart that the venous side is going to control because if we're losing blood rapidly and it can't provide the volume then our preload will only work for just a little while so when the heart rate increases the duration of diastole is shorter and obviously so right if it is pumping too fast we're talking like 160 times per minute or greater that's not enough fill time we'll, we won't be able to increase preload matter of fact we'll definitely lose preload we'll lose systolic blood pressure the left ventricle measures systolic blood pressure and we'll lose it then we have venous return and again we're talking about the, the venous side or the right side of the heart controls that volume if it's not able to provide us with the volume preload will never happen but if we can get greater preload we will actually increase stroke volume and we can increase cardiac output and that will uh, that will lead to an increased blood pressure frank starling was the man who uh, did who discovered this process tested it and can claim it as his own 
If we have someone, though, that we have increased preload, then we need to understand that that's the body's way of compromising for a failing heart or blood loss. If we don't treat that problem, then we are going to not be able to maintain perfusion, and which is the heart of this chapter, guys. And then we talk about myocardial contractility. And what that means is just the strength of that ventricle to pump that blood out. We're going to get an increase from stretching that left ventricle. But we're going to have a little bit of help, remember, from the sympathetic nervous system, specifically beta 1, that's going to have the epi and norepi to increase that strength of contractions. But also, let me take you back to what we first started talking about, which was anaerobic metabolism. And we know that can lead to problems with the sodium potassium pump. And if it does, we're not going to be able to even think about preload for very long before we start having issues with just contracting the heart normally. When we talk about afterload, that is the amount of pressure this left ventricle is going to have to overcome <clears throat> from the system already, from this right side of the heart, remember, it's, it's worried about volume, so it's vasoconstricting, causing that diastolic pressure to go up. The diastolic pressure, or the bottom number, but let's call it diastolic pressure, represents afterload if we're pumping against the pressure we're going to be having to pump harder through the aortic uh, through the aortic valve through this curve right here getting blood up and out we're fighting gravity afterload uh, can lead to heart failure left ventricle failure because we have an increase in cardiac workload. Systemic vascular resistance. All right, so if we are in shock and we have the right side of the heart working to increase volume, in order to increase volume, if blood loss is occurring, we've got to get that blood from somewhere. It's coming from those lower extremities we're, we're moving that blood up to the core, and we move it up to the core by increasing resistance. Um, this is where, if we increase resistance, then we can see that also in the diastolic blood pressure. And this is where we start having that narrowing of the systolic and diastolic. And, you know, SVR, what's it mean? It means vessels are constricted, less blood, less O2, and anaerobic metabolism. So here we go. Let's talk about this, what, how we can uh, detect it. Um, <clears throat> systolic blood pressure. Right? So that's going to measure your cardiac output. The left ventricle is responsible for cardiac output. That means systolic blood pressure represents your left ventricle. So it's going to represent its strength and contractions. It's also going to represent the amount of blood that's coming out of it. Diastolic blood pressure is a measurement of the resistance of the veins, okay? So we're looking at the diameter as well. If they are shrinking in diameter because they are moving blood from lower extremities to the core, they're becoming smaller, increasing pressure, and we'll see that in the diastolic blood pressure. So what we do is, 
if that's the case, we're going to take 132 over 74, for instance. We're going to take your systolic minus your diastolic and get that number. Then we're going to get 25% of the systolic by multiplying by 0.25. And we're going to compare the numbers. 58 is definitely greater than 33, so it's not narrow. This number would need to be 33 or less to be narrow. All right, guys, I think I finally got through it. I'm not quite sure. Oh, no, we're not. We got to talk about bearer receptors. <clears throat> so here we go. Bearer receptors monitor stretch in the aortic arch carotid sinuses. They send impulses to the medulla, indicating that the blood pressure can be high and needs to be reduced. If that's the case, the parasympathetic part of the nervous system is going to need to kick in. It's going to need to do its job. It gets called in to work finally. And so what it's going to do is going to cause reduction of impulses and signals that go through. Remember the SA node, AV node? It's going to slow the heart rate down by doing that. So here we have the baroreceptor's response to the blood pressure. So if we have an increase in blood pressure, we have an increase in the parasympathetic nervous system that's going to increase dilation. Okay. If the baroreceptors increase that stretch, okay, so that means they're stretching more, the sympathetic nervous system is going to be called in to decrease. We're going to send a message to the medulla. And the medulla is going to release those, release the sympathetic nervous system to reduce heart rate and contractility to lower the blood pressure. Remember the vasomotor center that's in the medulla? It's going to regulate blood vessel tone. It's going to, it's constantly adjusting to the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Increased blood pressure, then the vasoconstriction increases, and that's where we see SVR kick in. Guys, that is it. I feel like I've been going forever. I don't know how long it's gonna be a long one though. All right guys, so that's it. Study, study, study. You've got all the information, you've got all the tools. You guys can all do well. If you apply yourself this weekend have a great evening and i will look forward to seeing you guys on tuesday i'm not going to be here monday but i'll be here tuesday to see how you did have a good weekend